Okay. We're going to give everybody about a minute to come in. I'm going to go ahead and make Ken the host. If I can figure out how to do that. <laughs> Ken, you're the host. And then... Give it just a second. Thank you everybody for joining us this morning for uh, our QMS uh, management course session on leadership uh, presented by Pathologists Overseas and ACP Strong Together with our two speakers this morning, Paul Labby and Mary Jo Boniface. Uh, very excited to have them with us. There will not be a case today, but there will be polling questions. So about four times during the session, they will ask you to answer poll. That fourth question, they want you to actually put your answers in the Q&A box. So when we get to that question, be ready to type um, some answers in the Q&A box for them to review. As always, if you have questions during the, the presentation that we will answer at the end, please put them in the Q&A box. If you have a technical problem, please put that in the chat box. These are being recorded and will be available on the landing page about 24 hours after the session is completed and there should not be passcodes on any of those. We are making sure that that has been removed so that you can access them um, at any time. This is the last session for this week. Uh, next week we have two more sessions and then we are uh, concluding. So with that uh, I will turn it over to Paul and Mary Jo. Thank you Ken and uh, good morning everyone at least it's morning here in indiana it may be afternoon or evening where you're at but appreciate the time that you're going to spend with us uh, i am paul Labby. i am a long time laboratorian i uh, graduated with a bs in science and went on to get a master's in clinical laboratory technology it took me to uh, dayton ohio where i worked at miami valley hospital for close to 10 years and then became part of a, a regional laboratory uh, for the next 30 years and helped grow that laboratory outreach program. During that time, I got involved in the CLMA, the Clinical Lab Management Association, which really helped my career. And that's where I met my esteemed colleague, Mary Jo, and I'll let her introduce herself. Thanks, Paul. Um, I'm very happy to be with you all this morning. Again, I'm in Iowa and it's morning here. And so happy to be working again with ASCP to support their global outreach program. And I'm also very happy for the opportunity to work with my dear friend and colleague, Paul Labby. We, uh, we go back a long way together um, through our uh, board of director days on the Clinical Laboratory Management Association and uh, worked a lot together doing uh, advocacy on Capitol Hill for the laboratory industry and uh, have become great, great friends through that collaboration. Uh, I too spent a 40 year career in the clinical laboratory, uh, the last 30 as a laboratory director. And now that I'm retired, I'm happy to give back to the career that meant so very, very much to me. And this is one way volunteering my time to do things like this that is uh, very rewarding and a way for me to give back. And thank you again, Mary Jo, for being part of this. Um, as you all know, uh, throughout your career, you, you will make some terrific uh, professional associations along with some great friendships. Uh, and uh, I reached out to, to Mary Jo a few years ago because I was going to do a bike ride across Iowa, which was a week long program. And she was kind enough to host me in her house before and after that uh, process. So uh, part of this leadership uh, presentation is, is to talk about the qualities and traits needed, but also to make sure that you're enjoying what you're doing and having fun with that. So with that, let's get started. So, you know, as, as Dan mentioned, we're going to engage you uh, throughout this presentation with polling questions. We want to make sure that you're um, 
giving us feedback as to uh, a little bit of your background and also some of the things that you might uh, want to know more of from a leadership standpoint. And then we're at the end, we're gonna have you multitasking through the, uh, the chat and QA session because the last uh, question uh, requires multiple different answers. And we also want you to begin thinking throughout this presentation about the mentors and coaches that have impacted your life up to this point and the values that you admired in them. Uh, also think about uh, some of the resources that you've used, whether online or uh, books that you found valuable within the leadership category. And we're hoping that you might share that with us. Now, these pictures, uh, the one on the right is, uh, I was in Zambia, Africa in 2018 for a FIA conference there for a week. And these were the uh, leaders at uh, that presentation. Mary Jo, your picture is? Uh, my picture on the left is uh, from 2014 when I was in Dodoma, Tanzania, working with quality managers from clinical labs throughout Tanzania. And we were doing the strengthening laboratory management through accreditation, the SLAMTA training through ASCP. So at, at that time, um, it, in fact, if you recognize yourself in, in this picture, I'd really like to know and see how, uh, how you're doing since 2014. You were at that time recognized as emerging leaders. So it would be interesting to know uh, how far you are on your journey and uh, whether we were helpful at all when we were there doing the training and helping you become better lab managers and quality managers. Absolutely, we always we wanna hear that, that feedback from you whenever you, you can supply that. So. Let's move on to the first uh, polling question. I think we're going to put uh, Ken to work helping us out with this. Um, but this will tell us a little bit about your uh, current work environment, or at least the past 18 months. Uh, realizing that uh, the past 12 months of pandemic obviously may have created a different uh, uh, work environment for you as it did for many, many others. So during the past 18 months, um, your work environment entailed and this is a one of five choices here. You know, a project member or team leader working in a virtual environment. Uh, many of us had to adjust to, to that process. Or were you a project member or team leader working within the same team in person and on site? Now, we realize some of these may be a combination of the two, uh, but pick the one that, that really kind of stands out for you. A member or team leader working within multiple team or multiple projects is another choice. A consulting leadership role only, not considered a member of any team or maybe uh, none of the above for uh, apply. So that would be none of the above. So we hope that you will give your input to this now so we can get an idea of um, your background as it stands to the present as we move through this uh, presentation while we're waiting for the responses to be uh, entered and, and presented to us. Um, right. and we're also going to talk about uh, thinking towards towards the future too. So let's look at the past for right now. Wow. All right. 66% project member or team leader working with the same team in person on site. So a lot of you stayed wow. right there. Good. Yeah. A little surprising. When you say Mary Jo? Yeah. Really, but I think uh, with that high percentage for, for team leaders, I think you're really going to benefit from what we're going to be talking about in this uh, leadership presentation. Exactly, exactly. All right, thank you all. Let's see if I can get this to advance again here. All right. Ken, that polling question seemed to uh, Let's see if I can get this to work here. I treat, there you go. There we go. All right. Thank you. So, um, so let's talk about the objectives for today. Um, we want to refine the definitions, the styles, the examples of leadership. Uh, some of this information you already know or have, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Some of it may be new. 
but we want to then further encourage development of your leadership skills. I mean, let's face it, we're all leaders in a specific focus, especially within our technical uh, capabilities. But this leadership process within teams is uh, much more of a tool set that you need for the craft. And, and we're going to talk about those things. We want to amplify your leadership style in the scientific community. Again, scientists tend to be a little bit more reserved and inward focused, and we want to help you expand that and share, share that knowledge that you have and uh, in a non-arrogant fashion, because I know it's a little tough to, uh, to brag about yourself, but you have to talk about the accomplishments that you have and also that are possible within the team. So we want to uh, help you with that process. And then obviously the team aspect is so key in our organization. Uh, the collaborative techniques, uh, the different thinking processes and the partnerships available to help you and others move forward and, and even becoming a mentor and coach for others. So our final goal uh, on the objectives of this presentation is we hope you take away at least one new thought, idea, or concept to use in, uh, in your leadership uh, toolbox. So let's talk specifically about expectations of leaders in, in the healthcare community, because again, this is in addition to your scientific skill set. You, we all need to work effectively within teams and partners and the public. And, and, and the public oftentimes includes, you know, a patient base who are coming to us with lots of questions, lots of emotion. They want to find out what's going on and they're, they're very concerned and sometimes they're going to be acting out of their normal character because of that. And we have to, as leaders, understand where these individuals are coming from so that we can better lead them to where, where they, they need to go. So the, the key uh, issue, I believe, is strategically motivate uh, the diverse individuals towards a common goal. That's what leadership is all about. Albert Schweitzer had this quote, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I do know, the only ones among you who will really be happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. And, and Mary Jo will talk a little bit more about servant leadership. Okay, um, what is servant leadership? Servant leadership is a recognized leadership style and it's quite frankly, a fairly new theory. It's a philosophy and a set of principles with the primary goal of uh, having leaders enrich the lives of their individual team members and also through that build a better organization. It uh, focuses on achieving authority rather than power. And the leader actually shares power. In servant leadership, the goal of the leader is to serve, to put their employees and their team first. And the characteristics of a servant leader are they share their power, they put the needs of the team first, they help individuals develop and they coach their employees and help them optimize their performance. It's very important in successful team building to be a servant leader. And the takeaway here is successful leaders realize that to get the most from their employees or their team, they must first give the most to their employees and to their team. Next slide. All right, thank you. So let's talk a little bit about leadership definition and there are multiple definitions out there. This is one though, I, I, when I was a member of the CLMA board years and years ago, I pulled uh, the various people around the table of their definition of leadership. And this one really stood out for me. That, uh, this was from Mark Schmitz who uh, was a former board member and, and now a retired lab vendor and consultant and author. But, uh, his top three leadership values are communication, imagination, and team building. I think that said uh, it all in a very short, concise fashion. You know, 
a leader is a catalyst. They, they're going to use many skills and processes to motivate people to accomplish tasks, projects, and dreams that they would or could not accomplish on their own. Mark has gone on to become an author. Uh, he wrote this after he retired, Core Values, a Lifetime of Leadership Lessons Learned as a Texas Aggie cadet. And uh, so he, he started out in, in the military serving the country and uh, learned a lot of leadership. So it's a nice, short read. Um, it, he just uh, published it about four or five months ago, and I, I enjoyed it immensely. So that's, that's a resource uh, for you to, to, to use. Now let's talk a little bit more about the, uh, the, the one style there of communication. And I believe uh, Mary Jo's going to talk a little bit more about this. Yes, we're going to dig a little deeper into these three leadership traits. Um, the first and the number one skill of a great leader is communication. And you're going to hear this over and over and over again. And that communication includes the verbal, the nonverbal, and the paraverbal. Verbal is actually what you say. Nonverbal is... Uh, um, you know, your, your um, body language. And the paraverbal, that refers to the message that we transmit through the tone and pitch of our voice and the pacing of our voices. It's how we say something, not what we say. As far as imagination, um, we talked about having a vision and thinking out of the box. And Paul referred to your, your dreams. So with imagination, you need to know your purpose, dazzle your customers, be a team player, um, expand your skills, share your knowledge, think change and continue to learn. Imagination again is, is vision. One of the definitions that I really liked for leadership, in fact, I had this posted on my bulletin board in my office was leadership is a ability to have a vision, develop and map a plan, and take others along. Uh, and the, the third leadership trait is, is team building. Um, leadership is the art of motivating a group of people to act toward and achieving a common goal. So uh, in building your team, you should select for talent define the right outcomes, that's your goal setting, setting smart goals and, and accomplishing them. Focus on the strengths of your team and your team members and find the right fit for them. And the other thing I can't stress enough in good team building is appreciate your team effort. A, a good uh, thing to remember is you get what you give. Great leaders appreciate, appreciate the people that work with and invest time, effort and money to show their gratitude. So I can't stress that enough. Uh, great leaders also realize that their employees and the members of their team are their most important assets. And they constantly create development opportunities to help their people grow and advance. This is something we talked about in in good servant leadership. If you help your team develop, then you can also move forward yourself and develop new skills. But you have to make sure that your, your team is given developmental opportunities. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about a, a scenario that you may have um, been involved with. I, I use this type of example a lot, especially when you're in various projects, which involve a lot of ideas, a lot of people coming at you from different angles, and maybe it's multiple teams involved. But invariably, you, you perhaps have a team focused on, on a goal and objective, and you're moving towards that, and somebody else suddenly interjects from a, a different angle and says, you know, um, you're not doing what we want you to do. And oftentimes there's emotion involved. Perhaps there's a time crunch because this one individual is facing a separate timetable that perhaps the team wasn't aware of. And 
this can break down pretty quickly um, when it's emotionally charged. So as a, as a leader, you have to make sure you're putting that active listening in process. And that's a little tough to do when you feel like perhaps you and your team are being attacked unfairly uh, or, or being charged with something that, you know, just came out of the blue that nobody was aware of. So while it's very, very difficult for anybody, you have to remain calm in this kind of um, emotionally charged situation. And, and you have to let the person initially vent, at least, if that's what they need to do to kind of get that out. And then there's that point where you either have to, you know, calmly redirect them and say, well, look, uh, you know, I hear what you're saying. And this is a little bit news to us or we're trying to get there by going this path and you're asking us to take a different direction. Do you realize how that's going to be impactful for others? Now, this individual may still be so emo emotionally charged and upset that they're not going to give any inch or listen to what you're saying, in which case then you're going to have to try and remove them so that they're not so disruptive for the rest of it. It's, it's one of those that you almost go with your gut in a calm fashion as to how to address a specific situation. Because if it's somebody like your boss that's saying, oh, you know, you are going to do this no matter what, well, at that point in time, you're either going to walk away or you're going to redirect the team and, and explain the situation to the team as, okay, we've got a new objective and we're going to go that direction. But the whole point is, it's a, it's a leadership opportunity of how best you handle it. If you get into a, you know, a, a shouting match or, or a he said, she said kind of thing, um, and that's not going to be productive for anybody. And so you have to be the true leader here by going at this in a very, very calm, calm fashion. So, all right. Well, I think we now have the second polling question of uh, situations that you've encountered as, as perhaps one that you know I just referenced. So what, what uh, roadblock or issue uh, have you encountered within the past year on your on your team or in your project or personal issue? Um, and, and you have uh, six choices here. Was your roadblock an assigned goal with an unrealistic expectation? Or was it a team or project leader with little or no recognized authority that here you are trying to lead this group, but you you really have no tools at your disposal other, uh, other than your word? Um, perhaps it's an uncooperative team member that is interrupting a good team process flow, you know, and, and what a roadblock that can be for the rest of the team, demotivating. Or is it changing of original goals or objectives from outside influential sources? Then again, it's rare that we only have one roadblock. Some, some roadblocks uh, can be predicted, others not so much. And so, you know, one of the answers might be the multiples of the above. Then again, maybe you've had a clean slate and you've had no issues or problems in the past. Um, and so therefore, again, none of the above. That. Uh, I guess would be nice, but do you really learn anything from that when you don't encounter roadblocks? All right. Ooh. <laughs> Commentary there, Mary Jo? <laughs> well, <laughs> I first saw the 38% of uncooperative team member <laughs> and then multiples of the above. So uh, you people have your work cut out for you. <laughs> Yes, and that could be perhaps even multiples, maybe uncooperative team members, you know, that is rather limited on these questions, but all right, uh, you know, multiples of the above and uncooperative team members, good challenges or not so good challenges. But we'll try and uh, see what, uh, what we might be able to offer as advice. So again, uh, you know, know your environment, continually practice towards that improvement, but successful leaders do understand people. I mean, that's really the key. 
certainly you have to understand your place in the organization, your own leadership style, um, the situation you're in, but ultimately it comes down to working with people. And there's such a diversity of people and their motivation and their, their culture and their ways of thinking that it can be pretty, pretty complex. But that's why, you know, it takes work to lead a team. You have to get to know your individuals and you're thinking, well, how is that possible? I, you know, I've, I've got this huge project. I've got this deadline to meet and, and we've got to get these folks moving. But if you come through it with a more authoritarian style, you perhaps aren't going to get much of a buy-in from people that don't like to be managed or told what to do without really understanding what they need to do and where they're coming from. So it takes practice over and over and over again. Hence the quote from Michael Jordan, a great basketball star who, as he states, you know, he missed 9,000 shots in his career and lost 300 games and 26 times have been trusted to take the game winning shot and I missed. So you're gonna have failures over and over and over, but that doesn't mean that you don't keep trying and that's why he succeeded. And I'll add to that, uh, you're going to have to learn how to communicate differently based on who you're communicating with. For example, um, the situations may vary or if you're dealing with say a staff member, a fellow employee, or if it's the CEO of your institution, uh, you're going to have to work on developing different communication styles based on, on uh, who you are actually communicating with. So uh, keep practicing and be prepared. Exactly. Again, know, know your environment. You know, you can go to, to the definition of motivation because that's really what drives all this. You know, motivation is that I can do this, but how can we get everybody thinking together that they can do this if they're coming from different um, aspects and, and parts of their careers and, and where they're at as a person. So in my mind, uh, the capacity of leadership is the ability to lead, but it, it's also, okay, see that vision, communicate that vision, and then drive it with that passion or that motivation, because I think leadership without motivation is a job. Okay, we got to get this done. Let's do it. You know, let's go step by step, check it off the list. Or you can do it with motivation, which, which, which has everybody saying, you know, this is going to be a terrific goal to achieve. And we're going to use each other's talents to get there. And then you're going to go out there and celebrate it because you did this together and it was fun. I mean, isn't that what it's all about, right? So in the next couple of slides, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, history and, and again, Many of you probably already know some of this, but you know, as part of the presentation, we felt it was making sure everybody was on the same page. So, you know, Maslow uh, came uh, back or, or wrote this paper back in 1943. So this is 80 years strong and going about uh, the hierarchy of needs and the motivation based on physical needs, which means that in order for anybody to really contribute, first of all, they want to make sure that you know their their physiological needs are are met and their safety needs. They're in a safe environment. They're they're um, they're you know they're not concerned about where their next meal is coming from because that is certainly a a motivation to distract you from moving towards other goals. And then they want to be belong. You know, if you're on a team, you want to make sure you, you feel like you're part of the team and that that whole self-esteem runs into this. So that's that kind of general foundation of Maslow's thinking is that before you can move in even higher into that um, growth of um, higher needs with uh, self-actualization and the, the, the transcendence to, to true team pro 
processes and leadership that you have to have this, this strong foundation uh, at the bottom. Now, now, other theories have come along where Herzberg's two-factor theory was more of, okay, yes, you have to address the physical, but then you also have to address the growth, and they're really not one versus the other. You can do that uh, essentially together. Now, I've included uh, a link if you want to get a little bit more into the various motivation and leadership styles. I'm sure most of us have heard about uh, the management by objectives. You set clear goals and objectives. Uh, you evaluate your team members on, on the compliance towards those goals. And it's a very straightforward, and some would say even more scientific approach to uh, leadership management. On the other hand, you know, do people want to be managed or do they want to be uh, self-driven? So, you know, there's oftentimes with these uh, theories of leadership and, and motivation that you're using really a combination of a lot. Total quality management, another one, that, that's more of a partnership approach, a participative between supplier, producer, customer, patient, organization, what have you, that everybody's brought together and said, okay, this is where we need to go. These are the ones that were these goals, perhaps, or, or objectives we're going to put in the parking lot at this point in time, and we're going to concentrate on one this one specific goal, and we're going to get there first, and then address the others as we go along. CQI, the continuous quality improvement, we covered a little bit of uh, that with the uh, the process improvement that some of you may have uh, participated in a few uh, weeks ago. <clears throat> And then we have, uh, you know, a mix, like I said, of, of, uh, of leadership styles. We've got McGregor's X, Y and modified Z where, um, you know, the X is saying, okay, you've got team members that need direction, you need authority, they're fair. It's kind of a negative approach that you're working with team members that are not motivated or, or just need to be told what to do versus you've got the Y that are highly motivated. So then you let them kind of, you give them the general sense of, of where to go and how to get there, and, and they'll drive themselves to that direction. Um, the, the, the Z, again, is, is a little bit more of, okay, what is your background from a cultural diversity, societal type of thing? You know, can, we, can we drive each individual by getting to know them a little bit better and, and pinpointing what, what drives their motivation towards that? And then you have the Tannenbaum and Schmidt, the continuum of leadership, where you, you as you, especially with uh, the new task or perhaps a new team member that's unsure of how they fit in the team, you have to balance this whole process of helping them off initially and get in, giving them guidance, but as they gain more confidence and more self-awareness of their participation within the team, then you can kind of let them fly and, 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 and go in the general direction that you need them to go. You have contingency leadership, you know, the if, if you need this, then we're going to do this and we're going to move towards that training process to um, move things along within the team. Uh, or it could be based on a situational uh, analysis, you know, the switch situation that you find yourself in, you're out in the field, you have very little resources, you're trying to factor in um, how you can get through the, the various roadblocks without all the tools that would make that easier for you to do. And, you know, many of you had talked about that, you know, a roadblock is an uncooperative or uh, unresponsive team member. Well, I've always, I've had to deal with this many, many times, and I'm sure Mary Jo has too, in, in the various uh, work environments that we've had, we had to probably pull that, well, I know I've had to pull a team member aside and just have a one-on-one -on -one direct conversation where I ask open-ended questions and, and say, you know, why is it that you're not responding to this? Or why is it that you're not uh, showing up on time because it impacts the rest of the team. Um, but, but again, you have to be non-emotional and 
very calm when you're presenting these questions and letting them answer so that you can keep asking those questions and diving down, well, what is it that's driving them? Oftentimes, I, I would say, you know, eight out of 10 times, just having that direct one-on-one -on -one conversation that's open and that shows that you're caring about the individual that you ultimately find out what that issue is with them. And you may not be able to convert them completely, but I've seen where we've actually gotten to the point where they become a valued member of the team. Now I said eight out of 10. There was 20% that no matter how much I tried to drive down and, and listen to their issues, or maybe they were unresponsive completely, then we had to, we had to separate them from the team. And I've often told people uh, that being separated from a project that you've worked on can be earth shattering uh, because you're no longer part of that team and that self-esteem can be uh, hit pretty hard. On the other hand, it could be one of those things that makes you then sit back as a person if you've just been separated from that team to maybe do a little soul searching and maybe it wasn't your thing, but it will help direct you to go to a different project that is your passion. You know, Mary Jo, you may want to chime in on this, but yeah. I've, I've had to fire a few people in the authority positions that I had, but I, but I often have said, I'm not the one that is doing the firing. It, right. it, it's, it's, they are doing the separation. You're, yes, it's, it's their actions that creates the opportunity to fire them. Um, I had the very first person I ever had to fire and I was only I was only the lab manager for um, a couple months, and it it was it was really hard for me, and especially because I had a good working relationship with this person when you know when when we were um, co-equal employees, and then I became the manager. But um, some wise words from our pathologist, he said, you know, Mary Jo. I don't know one person who we've ever had to fire that didn't end up better off. The reason they got fired is they weren't right for this job or they weren't right for this position. So, you know, don't feel bad. Um, you're, you're doing the right thing and you're doing the thing you have to. And it's them who got themselves fired. Um, so, I, you know, I, and I, I thought about that for a, a long, long time. And actually it was very good advice, which I've even used with, with other people who I've had to have them fire somebody else. Um, the other thing that comes to mind here, uh, a lot of times you're asked what your leadership style is. And I was always defining my leadership style as I, I managed with gentle firmness. You know, I, I wasn't the authoritative manager, the dictator, I, you know, I, I, I was firm with what I expected my employees to do, but you can also direct them and get them to do what you need them to do in a gentle manner. So um, that's why I described my management style as gentle firmness. And I, I could see that I can vouch for that. Yes, uh, just with my uh... Yes, partnerships and working with Mary Jo. I would say that, yeah, so when she's focused, she'll, she'll be firm about it. <laughs> so, you know, Mary Jo just touched about this whole leadership motivational grid. And um, I, I know that many of you may be thinking, well, yeah, but I'm a, a, a member of this team and I'm not necessarily a leader of the team and I don't have the authority to dismember a team member. Uh, from the team, so to speak. So um, someone still needs to, you know, you're a co-team member that doesn't prevent you from talking to the individual and saying, well, what is it that can, you know, that can get you really engaged in this? Or why are you so upset about this process? I mean, just having that one-on-one, -on -one, you don't necessarily need the authority to fire someone, but you, you have the capability of at least 
improving the communication and caring for that individual, knowing that they're, they're just not happy. Um, this, this last uh, uh, motivational grid, because uh, Mary Jo talked about uh, the grid is the, the type of, of leaders that you can be. One, personal leadership style based on concern for the people or, or the product, the production, uh, versus a task manager with little regard to feelings and employees' concern is completing the work. Again, you may have been involved in the team and the team ultimately got that project done, but it was a lot harder than it needed to be because of various team members' uncooperativeness or um, making the task much harder for, for the other members of the team. Really have to, as Mary Jo said, you really have to encourage that individual to, to think about what is it that's really driving them. And maybe they just need to withdraw from that team completely and go on to a, another project. Um, on, on that, as an exa I have an example, um, not, a, not for a ineffective team member that you have to get rid of, but I have an example of an ineffective leader who was my boss. Um, he was, he, you know, a good person and, and, and a good boss, but he was ineffective in that um, he had a great management team but we were micromanaged to death and it was demoralizing for the team because we felt he had no no trust in us it was like we were given a project to do and developing all the ideas and how to get the project done and get it done on time and and meet our goals and then all of a sudden he would step in and and take over and and say, well, I don't think you should do that. I think you should do it this way because this is the way I would do it. And um, I actually, we had a good working relationship and I felt very comfortable talking to him. And I said, look, you are the administrative director. And if you compare that to an orchestra, you are directing the orchestra or this team. And so that getting us all to work together so that we sound good as an orchestra. And I said, what you're trying to do is you're the orchestra director, but you're trying to step in and play each one of the instruments, which you really can't do because you can't be good at all of them. I said, you're, you're trying to be the administrative doer rather than the administrative director. And we can't sound great as an orchestra we need to work together as a team and you need to direct us. And it was kind of like, wow, is that really what I'm doing? And I went, yes, that's really what you're doing. Be the director, not the doer. And uh, things actually, they actually changed. He was still a micromanager, but, but because it was brought to his attention that, that he was demoralizing the team, that um, things actually did get better. So it's, Sometimes it's not always the team that has a problem. It might be the leader. Excellent. Thanks, Mary Jo. And, and let's talk a little bit more about the, the relationships because our, our training is science that are very concrete, measurable objectives that we had. But as leaders, you need to really understand your customers and balance your time with the people. Carla Horner, who many of you know, Program Director of Heart to Heart International, I will uh, read this quote. It's all about relationships. As laboratorians, we were trained to produce accurate results in the shortest amount of time with the mantra of quality. When we moved to management, we continued that mantra while learning finances, quality assurance, process improvement, safety and federal regulations. Those come easily to us because they are concrete measurable objectives. The stretch for most laboratorians is the relationship side. We have to get out of the basement and develop relationships with the chief executive officer, the chief financial officer, the physicians and the nurses. And at the same time, we need to develop relationships with our employees. A good percentage of your time should be spent talking face to face with doctors, nurses, administration, your employees, your team members. You cannot be a successful leader or manager without knowing your clients, employees, your organization, even your patients. Great leaders understand that their success or failure 
rest on the quality of their relationships with others. And they invest heavily in building and deepening those professional relationships. If you have an opportunity to belong to a professional organization, I highly re recommend it. And that's the end quote from Carla. But I would um, validate that the Clinical Laboratory Management Association that I belonged to for years and was on the board was just an exceptional organization that taught me so much more uh, about myself and, and how to be a good leader. And Mayor Jo, I'm sure you would say the same. Oh, yes, absolutely. And I think uh, if you're like most uh, leaders, you were likely picked to be a leader because of your technical skills. And uh, if you're like most lab folks, uh, you have great technical skills, but you really have to work hard on the personal skills on this communication. And here we are talking about that number one leadership trait, again, communication, really working hard at developing your communication skills and, and how to communicate with, with everyone. And, and, you know, as Carla said here, get out of the basement. Well, most of our labs are, are in the basement, no windows. And I think a lot of us became laboratorians because we were introverts. So it's hard for us to, to um, step out of the box, out of our comfort zone um, and, and really develop those, those personal skills. But um, practice, practice, practice. Fake it till you make it. Just uh, keep learning and then keep practicing your communication skills and, and what you need to do to be a good leader. And again, um, I will echo what Paul said. If you have the opportunity to belong to any kind of a professional organization, I highly, highly recommend it. It, it did more for my, my career, but also for my personal development because you have the support of other professionals in your field and, and great leaders and, and great mentors. So if you have access to a professional organization, please, please um, join it. I love the, uh, the quote here on the screen from Zig Ziglar. People often say that motivation doesn't last. Well, neither does bathing. That's why we recommend it daily. You know, change is hard for everybody. And, and I often use when I'm on site this example of having people uh, write their name out and then tell them to do that again, but use their non dominant hand. And how difficult that is to go, perhaps, if you're right handed and then try and write your name with your left hand, how, how difficult that is. Well, that's really what any change is about is that it's problematic, but if you start doing it enough, you ultimately become pretty decent. Yeah, maybe your left hand signature is still different than your right hand, but you're starting to make it more readable or vice versa if you were left-handed to begin with and then right-handed. So um, yeah. change is difficult. Yeah, let, let's, let's talk a little bit about what the leader's role in, in change is. Um, and here we are, the number, the, the first and foremost role is to be a good communicator. Um, I, I often say, uh, as a leader, you have to learn to manage change or the change will manage you. So how do, you, how do you do this successfully and effectively? Well, number one, communication. It's the number one trait of a successful leader. And the next thing is uh, collaborate. Your, your team prefers to hear how change will affect them and they prefer to hear it from the person they report to rather than someone else. Your, your team should know what's happening and then plan for the change and you should involve your team in the process whenever possible. Now, sometimes change is going to come down from on top and you know, there's not much they can do about it, but it, at least involve them in the process and communicate with them what's going to happen. Um, the, the next C is commitment. Successful change leaders make sure that their own behaviors and beliefs support the change. 
you can't get other people to to come along and affect change if you don't believe in it yourself. So your job is to make sure that your beliefs and your behaviors monitor or um, uh, support the change that you're trying to uh, implement. Hi, hi Mary, uh, uh, Mary Jo, and um, uh, there we have two questions that I think might be good to ask now. Is it okay, or do you want to wait till the end? Sure. Go okay. Ahead. Here we go. So one, because you were talking about uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the, the the most recent question is very interesting. So. It's the kind of opposite of what you've been talking about. It says, what are the best ways <laughs> to handle sabotage? Mm. <laughs> uh, anything other than just sabotage? There's no other explanation. Uh, basically. Yeah, there's no background to this. So maybe we can ask whoever asked this question to give us a little bit more detail behind it. And then I can give you the, the other question. Okay. okay. Which on, the, is, on the sabotage question, is it... Yeah. Uh, sab sabotaging the team by a team member or is it uh you know sabotage sabotaging a project or is it uh you know much much deeper and and sabotaging something in the actually in the laboratory that is, is going to affect patients so we'll yeah so um uh We'll hope that the, the, the person who asked that will come back with Mr. Nyaji will come back with more detail around that. Um, so but the other question says, what makes the best leaders? Uh, do you think that such a course or a course like this should be included in the lab medicine curriculum? Well, yes, I believe this should be part of a curriculum for anybody in any course um, because it involves interaction with others and, and because of the diversity and, and the backgrounds, oftentimes it's that lack of understanding that creates the conflicts that are encountered. So uh, I believe leadership that is talking about communication and interpersonal relationships is key no matter what position, job, career that you have. Uh, as far as best leaders, well, you know, that that really depends on you. What is your motivation? What is your goals and objectives? What is your, um, what are the people that, that, that you look up to and admire? Because, you know, we could ask that question as a polling question and we, you know, who is a great leader? We'd have you know, 40 different answers. So that, great leader is one that motivates and inspires you. Mary Jo? Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, as far as con uh, including this leadership in clinical lab medicine curriculum, it, it's like Paul said, it's, uh, it's, it's not just for leaders and supervisors, the communication skills necessary, the, the active listening, the the other things that we talked about, uh, that could be helpful in your, in your even at your at home personal relationships. Or uh, you spend most of your day working with the people in the laboratory or your, you know, your institution or whatever your job is, rather than the people at home. So you need to learn to effectively communicate with them. Uh, and a leadership course in clinical lab medicine curriculum, well, you may, you may think now you have absolutely no desire to be a leader or a supervisor or to move up into manage, but, but um, that could all change five years from now or, or whenever. Or if you're that lucky person that gets picked to be a supervisor because of your technical skills and you don't have the interpersonal skills to, to do the job well, this this, uh, I, th I think it would be um, a, a really good opportunity to teach some leadership skills. And let's, uh, let's follow up uh, at the end regarding the uh, sabotage question. Yeah. We certainly address that, but 
you know, since we're running probably a little short on time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there, there are a few more questions coming in now, but I'll hold it till the end. Okay. Great. So when we're talking about communication, I just threw this in regarding uh, the brain processes, all the different things as we're receiving the message and what's happening in our brain. And oftentimes, the only reason I posted this is that, you know, the brain's doing a lot in the background, but we're also doing a lot in the background oftentimes when somebody is talking to us. And if we're not actively listening, then we're not really hearing very well. So we have to make sure that we're not already trying to prepare a response to some of the initial words that were given. We need to continue to stay engaged with that individual and with the eye contact and the nodding of the head and showing them that you truly are listening. Now, I have a story there with them. I, I was a, a type of a manager leader that if somebody couldn't get to the point, um, they knew right away that if they couldn't get their message across within five minutes, that I was starting to disengage just by the, the look of my face. Apparently, I would clench a jaw and it's like, you know, let's get to the point here. What are you trying to tell me? And, and they, it was known as a Paul face. So uh, <laughs> it was oftentimes that, that, that I trained uh, other people that came into my office that said, you know, you're going to have to get to the point and not beat around the bush when you're talking to Paul, because if you can't get it done in five minutes, then, you know, he's done with you. And sure enough, you know, I, I strive for efficiency. Now, if they wanted to talk longer about a personal issue or whatever, then we would schedule a time that was convenient for both of us. But I always had an open uh, door policy for people to come in. It was just that they knew that they had to get their point across. Quickly, um, and that was, you know, just something that that uh, everybody learned. So, Mary Jo, I think you're going to uh, cover cover this on listening skills, right? Yes, yes. Um, active listening is it harder than public speaking? Well, you prepare for any presentation, don't you? Yes. So, do you do the same for active listening? Uh, we're we're going to go of a, a brief overview of the uh, six parts of six key active listening skills and give you some tips on improving your active listening skills. And I think you've heard the term active listening several times during uh, this presentation. Uh, first of all, successful leaders will place a higher value on listening than they do on talking. And um, what active Active listening is basically, it's a speaker-centered process where you take in what the speaker is actually saying, but you don't add your own input. You, you let the speaker tell you what they want to tell you. You encourage the speaker to continue talking and then you clarify what they're saying. And basically members of your team are going to feel valued when it's clear that you as the leader are actually listening to them. And one way to show that is through active listening skills. The first one is pay attention. Set a tone that gives your team members an opportunity to think and speak and actually seek input from the team. Again, you don't want to be the talker, you want to be the listener. And you do that by asking open-ended questions like, what do you think? How do you feel about this? And, and then make sure you allow time for them to answer. Be sensitive to the emotional state. If the speaker is happy, then you can be happy with them. If they're upset, make sure you respond neutrally so that you don't feed the fire. You don't want to match their agitated state. And be focused on the moment and, and respect the listener. Acknowledge the speaker. When you acknowledge them effectively, you show that you're listening. And you can do that verbally by saying things like, oh, I see, yes, uh-huh. And non-verbally by nodding your head, making eye contact and leaning toward the speaker. That shows you're engaged. The second, uh, the second skill is withholding judgment. And this can probably be one of the most difficult to put into practice. You have to be open to new ideas, new perspectives, and new possibilities. And when you're having a conversation, stop arguing in your head with the speaker when you're supposed to be listening. 
when you're too busy creating a reply in your head or analyzing what they're saying, you obviously are not listening. If you're running through a list of reasons why an idea won't work or why the speaker is wrong, that's not listening either. So even when good listeners have strong views, they suspend judgment and hold any criticism and avoid any arguing or trying to sell their point of view while the speaker is speaking. The third skill is reflect, reflection. And that is paraphrasing or repeating what the speaker has to say using terms like, so what you're saying is, or you seem to think that, and repeat what they're saying. And then when, when, you're, when you're done with that, restate the big issue, not just one part of what was said, but um, if you focus only on part, the speaker might think you weren't listening to all of it. So uh, make sure you don't restate only part of what the issue was, but rather the big issue. Uh, when someone's upset, active listening is a good way to be supportive and also help diffuse the emotions. And reflect is it, reflecting is an active listening technique that truly indicates that you and the speaker are on the same page. The next is clarify. Uh, don't be shy to ask questions about any issue that's ambiguous or unclear when you're engaged in active listening. As a listener, if, if you have doubts or are confused about what they're trying to say, uh, you can, you can interrupt at that point and say something like, let me see if I'm clear on this, or are you talking about X, Y, or Z, or wait a minute, I didn't follow that. Can you please repeat that? So I'm sure I understand what you're trying to say. Uh, when you're engaged in active listening, the emphasis is on asking rather than telling. So it invites a thoughtful process and it, it also maintains the spirit of collaboration. The, the next one is to summarize. So you restate the key themes as the conversation proceeds and it confirms and solidifies your grasp of what the other person was actually trying to say or their point of view. And this helps both parties be clear on any mutual responsibility or any, any follow-up. So briefly summarize what you've understood and ask the other person to do the same thing. You can say something like, let me summarize to check my understanding. Did I get that right? And if you reinstate the key themes, it helps both parties be clear on any mutual responsibilities or any follow-up that's necessary. The final uh, skill is to share. Active listening is first about understanding the other person rather than about being understood as the listener. And as you gain a clear understanding of the other person's pr perspective, you can then begin to introduce your ideas, feelings, or any suggestions. And once the situation has been talked through in this way, you and your team will have a good picture of where things stand. And from this point, then the conversation can shift into actual problem solving. As the leader, you have to continue to query, to guide and offer, but don't dictate a solution. Your team will feel more confident, eager if they think through the solutions on their own and, and any options that they have to offer. So I think if, if you can practice this um, when you're working with your teams and be cognizant of active listening, you'll find that you can identify any problem areas that can exist on a project and you can make decisions that are based on information from the conversations. And it's also a supportive behavior that is more conducive to cohesive teams. Your team will work much better if you practice this. And active participation from team members leads to more innovation and creativity. And it also helps the ideas flow more freely when you're, when you're working on a project or working on a solution to a problem. Thanks, Mary Jo. All right, let's talk about uh, the different styles and I'll go through this fairly quickly, but most of the scientific community tend to be more of a concrete sequential kind of communication style because it's methodical and predictable. We're really focused on 
the the procedural aspects of things uh, were were somewhat slow to change. Uh, but again, this is you know a, a broad brush type of thing. Uh, you also, though, from a communication standpoint, best understand others may not think quite like you do. Um, so you have the abstract or the random types of thinkers, the more intuitive thinkers, the risk takers, the theoretical models type of thing. You know that that may. Uh, be towards a, a research mind type of thing, or those risk takers that are more innovative type of thinking. Uh, you know, I highly recommend if you haven't taken a Myers-Briggs types of test to go ahead um, online and they offer some free assessment so that you best understand what your style is, what you tend to um, feel more comfortable with. And it also then uh, teaches you a little bit more about how others think and their styles and their communication. So when you're on a team, you can often identify that style a little bit better. And this is the kind of topology indicator that is utilized. Again, you know, in my own personal style, when I first started out my career, I was an ISTJ up in the upper left-hand corner there. Um, the I stands for introvert versus the E stands for extrovert. Well, as I progressed through my career, uh, professionally, when I take this uh, assessment, I ended up being an ESTJ. So I forced myself to be more of the external type of administrator type of, of communication style because that's what my career uh, demanded. However, I still, and people are often uh, amazed when they find out that my comfort level is more of the introverted the uh, I aspect. Well, that's how I recharge. Oftentimes when I'm at conferences uh, and interacting with people all day long, I will then uh, disappear for a couple hours in the evening just to uh, be alone and kind of recharge with, you know, a good book or what have you. That again, this is kind of an awareness of the different styles that are that are out there. Um, Let's talk about the leadership teams that have been very successful in the more recent uh, processes. And again, it, you know, it, it doesn't mean that you have any particular um, sponsorship or you have any particular uh, authority type of process, but you know, I, I picked these three out because they were just, I mean, they, they were just fascinating how they got started, uh, you know, as far as Central Africa was being torn apart by militia and drug dealers and the, and the peacekeeping Boy Scouts were formed as an alternative to get people to work towards a common good and give folks an opportunity instead of joining the militia to join the Boy Scouts type of thing. It's a really fascinating story. The hope for Haiti addressing the education aspects, uh, the healthcare, the clean water. Um, again, a, a wonderful organization that was formed by individuals that were focused on their passion of making life better in that area. Uh, the Sisters of Notre Dame de Nemours have done a terrific job of purification packets and digging boreholes. None of these sisters were engineers by any means, but they developed this process in partnership for this photovoltaic panels for water treatment in Kenya and Nigeria and DRG. So, so you know, it, it, it again comes back to that communication, that partnership, that passion that brings this leadership process together. Um, Mary Jo? Thanks, Paul. Um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the leadership team building success and ASCP's global outreach training that I was able to participate in. Um, I did training in the uh, slip to the strengthening laboratory improvement process toward accreditation and SLAMTA, the strengthening laboratory management toward accreditation and also the black tot basic lab operations training and training of the trainer. Um, this was building successful teams to teach the WHO quality standards to achieve accreditation. My first experience with that was in uh, Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan 
in <clears throat> 2013 and then again in 2014 in the Doma, Tanzania. And I cannot tell you how rewarding that was for me. And um, I, I think I got as much out of it as, as the people who were participating. The enthusiasm of the participants in both of these training sessions, uh, it, was, it, was just, it was just overwhelming. Everybody was so hungry to learn and to improve the quality of their own laboratories. And, and uh, I just found it so rewarding and would love, love, love to do it again. Hint, hint, ASCP. <laughs> All right, polling question number three, personal development. So remember at the beginning, we wanted to see if, uh, if you needed anything to add to your leadership toolbox. So what, what's a personal goal that you have to enhance your leadership style? Is it gonna be more active listening or adjusting my style of leadership to the team and environment? Ensuring everyone understands the importance of clear direct communication recognizing the accomplishments of others, or maybe you don't need any improvement. Now, perhaps I, you know, we should have added a, a multiple here that you, know, you wanted to add more, but the question is, is, is there anyone in, in particular um, from a, a goal standpoint to, to, uh, to build on for your own personal development? As we're going to talk a little bit about you know, what leaders look like and, and evolving that, and then we'll get to uh, the Q&A. I like that note at the bottom, host and panelists cannot vote. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh. Pretty even across the board there, right? Okay. Thank you all for participating in that. Appreciate it. All right. So, can, you know, can you spot a leader? You know, that question was, you know, uh, who's, a, who's a good leader? Well, we all can be. Um, again, com a combination of things. Uh, Charles McDonald on the left there, he was. Uh, he was a laboratorian, but he got into the computer end of the laboratory and he was a computer IT specialist, but really wasn't his passion he discovered and he ended up getting back more into humanitarian work and working with uh, Heart to Heart International. Carla Orner, she worked for Mayo Medical as a uh, laboratory manager for a number of years, but um, again, her passion led her to, uh, to Heart to Heart and getting more involved in in helping um, other countries and, and laboratorians from a cultural standpoint in education. Kelsey got involved in the CDC as an intern and um, I met her uh, in Africa and it was inspiring to see how she was so inspired by the people that she was working with, but she was also inspiring others through her energy and, and uh, uh, innovative thinking that she brought from, from her youth. Teresa was involved in, uh, in the CDC Africa for quite a few years and really was passionate about the educational aspect. And uh, Mary Jo might have a comment or two about that last picture. Yeah, sure. Um, this, is a, this is a picture of, of Paul and me after one of our leadership training uh, board of director meetings for uh, Clinical Lab Management Association. And I think the, the, uh, the takeaway from this picture is uh, leaders have a really, really important role to play, but also don't forget to have fun. Take your job and your responsibilities very seriously, but uh, don't take yourself too seriously and remember to have fun. Absolutely. All right, a couple more, um, you know, pulled out the, uh, everybody I believe knows Bill, Bill Gates of uh, Microsoft fame, but in one of the TED Talks back in 2015, he says, the next pandemic, we're not ready. Well, <laughs> it turns out he was very strategic in his thinking. Now, the question is, is, is he a leader that you think about? 
is he a, a leader that you would admire or is he more just that strategic thinker process kind of individual? That's only, that's, that's for you to decide. Hopefully that kind of answered that question we had earlier, of, you know, who's a good leader? Well, it, it really depends. My leader is off there on the right of the slide. Um, this was an international company and they had a leadership team mantra, so to speak, that involved four key elements for team leadership. And it was always, and it comes back down to communication again. Tell your team, where are we going? Give them that vision, that goal. How are we going to get there? Talk about the objectives, the toolkit that's gonna to be available to them, the resources. Do you have my back covered? In other words, are you gonna stick up for me if I fail in a certain area or if I make a mistake or uh, are you gonna just, you know, start pointing fingers and say, well, you know, it's Paul's problem, Paul's fault. And then ultimately, do you care about me? So getting involved in each individual and that doesn't take a lot of time or intensity. It just takes a focused, tell me more about yourself. Tell me, give me your background. Let them know that you care. So to me, that's what a, a true leader is. Um, whoops. Then let's talk about forward thinking leaders. Well, a great example, again, an article that I ran across um, and uh, this was a gentleman, Frank, Fred Swanker, that started the African Leadership Academy. And he knew from statistics that it's expected almost half of the world's youth will be coming from Africa in 2200. And so what did he start? He started an academy. I mean, that's really strategic thinking and leadership forward thinking. Or think about Nelson Mandela, 27 years in prison, fighting apartheid. And yet he just kept plugging away and ultimately became president of South Africa. I mean, it was a long term process, but just an amazing, amazing accomplishment. So, you know, if you ask yourself back in 2006, 15. Where do you see yourself in five years? I will be A, within the continent of, helping advance the cause of, within a larger team towards a common goal. Now, maybe some of you did this, and it'd be interesting. Did you get it right? Because there was a lot of changes, and who, who knew what 2020 was going to bring, right? Or did, or did you take a little bit different approach, and you just did your own thing through building a foundation network with mentors and coaches and leaders and surrounded yourself by inspiring people. And, or in my case, I, I look at it, I was at the right place at the right time. Now, did I make some good choices? Yes. But to become involved in a unique joint venture laboratory because I was in that location it, and took the, the networking that I had to get into the position that I did. I, I felt very, very lucky, but I hope that there was a little bit of skill involved in that. And, and sometimes it's like things just naturally happen. Where do you see yourself though in five years? Do you wanna try and do this in 2021 and say, where do you see yourself in, in five years? Or I think Mary Jo said, because of all the changes that are occurring with technology and, uh, and, and, and the whole leadership principle process. Maybe it should be three years that you try and predict out there. I, I think that's true, Paul. You know, do we, in, in interviewing people, we stopped asking, where do you want to, where do you see yourself in five years? Because things change so, so rapidly. And I think for, for the participants here, um, it depends on how you answered the first question, um, how did you answer this question five years ago? And, and what has changed then? Have, do you have a different position? Have you gone from a technical to a supervisory role or, or a role as more of a leader? And, and based on what happened in your career, do you see uh, the future being different than what you thought it was gonna be? 
And if you're, if you're taking on more of a leadership role, maybe taking some of the tips that we've given you today to help develop where you want to be or where you, where you see yourself in three to five years. Exactly. Exactly. So as we end uh, the presentation, we're going to give you some resources here, of leadership modeling. And it's uh, Shinwe Esame, who's just, uh, again, another fantastic um, read uh, on her um, global passion towards anti-corruption, taking, taking on big corporations and political figures to reduce uh, corruption within the various uh, countries that she worked in. Just amazing story. Brian Blog, he's a former uh, uh, quarterback, professional quarterback that got into uh, leadership learning and he has a Monday morning leadership learning blog and it's, it's, he's always interviewing uh, various people on their leadership capabilities. Uh, and it's a, it's a nice hour long if you've got the time to, it's, it's free and you get to, uh, uh, listen in on those interviews and learn something new every time. Joan Gary's got a consulting business and she works a lot with nonprofit organizations, which as she states are messy. Uh, it's really um, tough to work a nonprofit that's a bunch of volunteers and then it has a board of directors that can be very diverse and have their own agendas. Uh, so it, it teaches you how to get through some of those roadblocks that you encounter no matter where you're at. And then Patty Eschleman, um, both uh, Mary Jo and I know her personally, and, and we actually have a, a Zoom call every month, uh, what we call it a happy hour, a social hour or whatever, but uh, she's, she's got uh, a lot of energy and has been very successful in the um, power of uh, magnifying your success. Here's some uh, uh, leadership books. Uh, and there's a lot of them out there. And in fact, uh, I talked to Dan about, I actually have some uh, leadership, brand new leadership books that were given to me that I could easily distribute around. And so if you're interested in, in getting uh, a leadership book, uh, you, can, you can drop us a line and, and we'll get that to you. But uh, the one blog that I had mentioned previously, um, um, just this past week, it was Mark Scherenbreich, uh, and his quote really stuck with me. Um, to be present in the lives of others is the greatest gift you can give. And to me, that's an ultimate uh, uh, leadership uh, uh, quote. So, um, Mary Jo, did you have others? Um, well, I told you the other day, the seven habits of highly successful people, uh, that's not just for, for uh, lab people but it's for you can use those seven habits uh regardless of what your position is um that's one of one of my favorites as far as as leadership okay thank you so we put together this this uh this list and i think mary joe's gonna kind of um, talk a little bit about this uh, ongoing progression in leadership development yeah, we've given we've given you um, our thoughts and on uh, leadership development, um, and you can take a look at these. What what works for you and for others? Drill down into your current leadership style, um, partnerships and collaboration scenarios. Um, he said, she said, how to handle conflict, be prepared for roadblocks, and. Not everybody is a team player, or are they? You need to find out what motivates them and maybe maybe change them into a team player. Um, I don't I don't know if you can access this video. Will Will it play from here, Paul? I don't. It may, but um, since we're uh, running short on time. Oh, okay, yeah, you can, uh, it, it's, it's rather funny. And it, it kind of describes our, our uh, day to day lives sometimes in the lab or as a, as a team leader. And uh, multitasking, or how do, you, how do you prioritize what's important when everything is important? And we also talked about laughter. It's, it's a great therapy. And sometimes it's a great 
icebreaker or when things are really tense, it, it doesn't hurt to just laugh. In fact, there's a, there's a whole um, actual therapy, laughter therapy um, that, that can help you. So um, also if, if you want to through, through chat now, uh, give us some of your ideas on um, leadership traits and styles. And remember at the beginning, we said we were gonna really put you to work towards the end. So we wanna give, have you give us uh, your thoughts on, on uh, leadership development that you'd like to see more of or um, talk about your, your mentors and coaches that you've had. We're gonna ask uh, our last polling question and because it's a uh, multitude of different types of answers, we're not gonna have you answer that on the screen, obviously, um, but we'd like you to respond through the chat or through the Q&A, as far as you know, what do you think are the qualities as a, as a successful leader? Again, it goes back to that one question that an individual had that says, when, you know, name successful leaders. Well, it really depends on what you're looking for, right? What do you consider those key qualities? What is it? What are those attributes and traits of a coach or mentor that has inspired you? You know, to me, it's it's someone that's that's truly uh, honest, uh, not just with themselves but with others, and that they they work as a, um, a a team thinker and visionary and towards a, a common goal that is good. Um, Mayor Joe, you you have thoughts? Um, okay, sorry. We have a lot of questions. That's why I'm trying to jump in. <laughs> oh, okay. People have been asking and we've been waiting. So can I can I start with, sure. with the questions? Okay, great. Um, so uh, let me ask. So this says, uh, I am Prince. Um, he says, as and that's his name, as the lab director, the lab scientists rejected blood samples sent by a doctor from the ward, claiming that the ID did not match with the request form. The doctor came back to the lab when he heard what happened and the ID on the sample was found to be correct after cross-checking. Against this background, the doctor came straight to you to report the situation. What would you do and how would you handle the situation as a leader? Well, I'd go directly to the lab scientists and ask if, first of all, there was some confusion or if there was, um, Really, something that he was concerned about. Uh, I got to go back to that communication and not kind of go to a third party and get into a he said, she said kind of thing. You have to investigate, do that root cause analysis and determine where the confusion resulted. Or is this something that somebody directly sabotaged again? Uh, you know, in which case, then you've got a whole different uh, issue to deal with. But to me, um, the initial laboratory scientists obviously felt that the ID didn't match. And why is that? If, if you've got proof now in front of you that says, well, you know, what's, what's not matching? And if they can't identify it, then to me, it's you know, a simple error that needs to be addressed with some perhaps further education and training. Mary Jo, thoughts? Yeah, I think that's true. The first thing you need to do as the, as the lab manager is to investigate. And that means talking to the, the, the person who rejected the sample, find out why and was, was this a, an, an error on their part? And then when you talk to the doctor, you'll have to explain it was, it was an error on our part, apologize. And, um, um, you know, say you talk to the, the uh, individual who rejected it and they, they're very sorry for their mistake and apologized for the inconvenience of the, of the patient. And uh, this is an area where you're gonna have to, you know, based on some things we said today, relationships and how you communicate with the employee may be a little different than how you communicate with the, with the physician. You're also going to have to use your active listening skills and depending on whether the physician is irate and angry, um, try to diffuse the situation and proceed calmly to get to the bottom of the situation. But several things are gonna come into play here. Your, 
your uh, relationship developments and how you how you relate to the different employee and the and the physician and also good use of your active listening skills. Great. So I have, I'm going to read here some answers that have been coming in to what is a good leader. Someone says approachable. Uh, someone else said, <laughs> none of my leaders so f have inspired me thus far. <laughs> they have all been extremely egocentric and selfish. <laughs> oh. And uh, um, I'll, I'll give you one more. And then says someone says qualities like honesty. So I'll, I'll let that sit with you. And then I'll read. I'll take us back to the sabotage question. Uh, Mr. Yanji did give us more detail. He says, our lab plans to implement a certain project. However, a group of, of about four staff were trying to solicit other staff not to engage in that project. How can you handle a situation like this without being autocratic or appearing insensitive? Um, I'll start out on that one, if you don't mind, Paul. Yeah. Th this, is, this is serious and it's going to jeopardize your, your entire project. So you need to stop this and you need to stop it right away as soon as you learn about it. What I would do is call in the four people who are part of this group that are, are trying to sabotage the project and, and make sure especially that you have the, the leader or the instigator of this, of this, this whole um, group. And, and then just sit them down and ask them, what is it about this project that is causing you to campaign against it? And is there some confusion about what this is supposed to accomplish? Is there some confusion as to why it's considered important to, to do this project? So clear up any confusion um, and then talk about why this is really good for everybody. And then, um, then ask for their cooperation. Ask them you know, what, what, it, what it would take to get them on board with the project. And you know, maybe they only wanna be heard. Maybe they wanna voice their their concerns about um, you know how this is impacting them, but you know the first thing is to stop it right away before before it goes any further. And uh, it says you know without feeling authoritative. Well, you're going to have to use your authority here. No, he said autocratic. Autocratic. Oh well, um, you know, be, not being non-autocratic, you can't yes. just say you you have to participate or else. I think I think. Like I said, they may just want to be heard and you want to get to the reason for why, why they don't want to, why they're campaigning against this project and, um, and, then, and, then, and talk about it. Maybe that's all it will take for them to be part of the team. And then they just have to know, okay, this is going to go ahead with or without you. I'd like it to be with you, but um, you've got to stop sabotaging the project because it's going on with or without you. Paul? No, I, I think you covered that pretty well. And I, I, I would also agree about the autocratic. I don't think there's a need to be autocratic, at least initially, because you're going to be more investigative. You're going to uh, talk with the individuals. You're going to ask them what's occurring before making any judgments. Now, if, they, if you can't convince them that it truly is kind of a sabotage, then, then you become autocratic and said, well, you know, we can't have you as part of this team. So. All right, so let me let me give you uh, so two more comments on what it is to be a leader. One says um, leading by example, being a very punctual and hardworking lab director. Um, and someone says uh, a mentor that inspired me displayed fairness, was firm, was motivating and upbuilding, was quick at learning individuals' weaknesses and strengths. Thank so you. we have that. So, okay, now next question. It says, uh, and there are ooh, seven more. Okay, uh, next question. If you're a gentle leader, but not firm and team members take advantage of your gentleness, how do you deal with this? Oh, this is a Mary Jo answer. Yeah, this is my, I, <laughs> that's got my name written all over it. Well, you know, I described my, my management style as gentle firmness, but uh, I wasn't so gentle that, that, people walked all over me. They, they knew what was expected of them because I made it very clear 
what I expected of them, the behaviors I expected of them. And um, when, they, when they crossed those lines, they knew that uh, I would uh, come down on them firmly, but gently. So um, if, if you're gonna be a, a, a gentle but firm leader, don't be so gentle that people know that they can walk all over you. You have to make it clear that, um, that um, you're, you're going to be fair with them, but that they can't take advantage of you. And don't let it, ha if it happens once, stop it right then so that uh, people don't think that uh, they can get away with it also. And I, I would recommend that book uh, by Shinwe Esame um, because that's kind of, I think her approach to things too. Awesome. Okay, so this one is a, it's kind of a big question. So it's, uh, the, this person is anonymous and, and he or she says, in my country, there is a lot of friction between lab scientists and pathologists. <laughs> this has played out in difficult work relationships. Managing teams in this atmosphere is quite challenging. In my center, we are slowly breaking down the barriers by developing opportunities for professional growth that benefits our scientists. However, translating this to a national scale is fraught with legal and bureaucratic potholes. <laughs> Any thoughts? <laughs> well, first of all, congratulations that you're slowly breaking down those barriers because you're obviously finding some of the keys to developing that professional growth. This isn't unique either. Um, this is worldwide where sometimes there's that gap of, uh, I don't know, whether it's the position or whether it's just arrogance uh, that um, there creates that, that conflict. But I, I'd be curious to know uh, what kind of professional organizations might assist you in breaking, helping uh, or sharing your successes that you're having with kind of taking it more from a, a regional to a national scale and seeing if there's uh, ways to influence the, the rules or bureaucratic uh, potholes, as you put it, to see if there's some opportunities to sh share your success regionally. All right. Um, that was a very good question, tough. All right, so someone says, as a leader, as a laboratory leader making appointments to positions that are key in quality management system implementation, what would be your advice on choice of appointments? Whether qualification level should play a role rather than hard work, competency, and passion if it's shown by its, a staff with lower qualification? So I, I don't know if that was clear. Let me, let me see if I can parse it. So basically, should qualification Trump hard work, competency, and passion. If it if it's someone if this if the person showing it has a lower qualification. Well, I'm not sure that that person really has a lower qualification if they're showing the hard work, competency, and passion. I mean, you can <laughs> sometimes um, it's easier to take someone that's got that passion and develop that skill set that they may be a little weak in from a qualification standpoint. But Mary Jo, let, let me think about that a little bit more. And do you have some thoughts? Yeah, well, I was going to say, if, if, you're, if you're appointing uh, quality management positions, is there, is there a job description for these kind of positions? Do people have to apply for it? Um, uh, if you if you announce that you're going to be uh, having a, a quality manager or um, uh, is it a, is a supervisor or somebody in the quality program, do you do you post the job and list what the qualifications are? Uh, if so, then the the qualifications are you know a dedication to quality. Uh, currently and passion for quality and things like that rather than you know technical expertise so I think maybe the way to get around that is to clearly define the position uh, and and define what you want in that position and then pick the people based on whether they 
have the qualifications that you're looking for for that particular job? Yeah, that's a good answer. And, and maybe my own personal situation might help that also. I got a certification as a nuclear medicine technologist. So I'm not a medical laboratory scientist. But I got involved in the radio amino assay portion of it, and that's what led me to the laboratory. And I ended up being the leader, an operational manager of the laboratory. Did I know all the skill sets of a hematologist, a chemist, a, a virologist? Any? No, but I knew how to bring uh, the people together. Uh, and so I would answer that if this individual can, can become a good um, quality manager that, that manages the systems well, along with the people, then to me, they're qualified. Okay, so those are great. I, uh, um, so I have a bunch of uh, responses to the question of what makes a good leader. So I'm just going to read those. One says inclusive, which I like. And next, next person, Mr. Fieri says, qualities of a good leader is ability to listen attentively, patience, clear direction slash guidance with zero tolerance to malpractice, et cetera. Set the bar high and leave it alone. Oh, set the bar high and, and live above, above it. <laughs> oh. uh, next, next one who's anonymous says empathy, good listening skills, ability to lead uh, from behind. Excellent. Um, and so I'm gonna, the two more comments here, but let me ask the, 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 the that we have two last, I think two, two last questions. So let me ask the one question here, um, which is what would you do um, if you are quality manager of anatomical pathology laboratory and the lab manager has no knowledge and time for the laboratory. Mm -hmm. He spends most of his time in meetings, which does not involve his laboratory. The team is demotivated and lacks skills. What do you do if you're that laboratory and eager to improve the laboratory? Wow. <laughs> you kind of ask why that that's person's tough. in that position. <laughs> so that's exactly what I was thinking. Why are they the head of this laboratory if they're never there? And Or they're not a very good communicator and maybe they are participating in these various meetings to elevate the position within the laboratory of whatever organization you're talking about. But uh, yeah, you know, there's some assumptions there that none of us can answer at this point in time. Um, I, I guess I would ask if they've even had a, a direct uh, conversation with the laboratory leader and share with them the ideas of how they think this AP lab could function much better um, or educate the current manager on what their team needs, which it sounds like. They need education, they need motivation. They, they wanna understand what the vision and the focus of the laboratory is, the overall purpose, you know, and, and does this manager have their back? I mean, those are all the questions you really have to ask that manager directly. And maybe this individual is so, I don't know, introverted and he or she is insecure about their lack of knowledge of an AP laboratory that they're looking for perhaps a good right-hand person. And that person could be you because you're the one that's uh, bringing this up to the leader. Right. I think you, you can't, you can't sit back and guess what's going on. I think this is, this is a situation that's going to involve a direct one-on-one -on -one with between the quality manager and the, and the manager of the department to, to just, you know, have a sit down and say, okay, you know what, th this seems to be a problem. How are we going to deal with it together and effectively? This is what I see that we need. Um, how, can, how can you help me and how can you help our department get there? It's, it's, not, an easy, it's not an easy conversation, but um, the more you ignore it and 
the more demoralized the team is going to be and the uh, the less work you're going to get accomplished as a team. Okay, so here are two more um, definitions of a good leader. It says, for me, I think a good leader is one who's open to feedback, willing to listen to team members and open to the suggestions because they are the ones who, that are most affected and hands-on with most arising matters. Leaders should be more friendly than scary. <laughs> uh, next one says, a uh, good leader has the ability to delegate and communication skills. Um, uh, and then next one says, quality of a leader is integrity. Absolutely. Um, okay, here we have a question. We have two questions. Um, both from individuals who have asked before. So one says, in medical laboratory practice, the leader by default, the lab manager, is expected to have broad spectrum knowledge on technical issues. Agree? Question mark. Hmm. Um, well, it, it depends on the situation, but not necessarily. I'll go back to a situation that I had as a, as a lab manager. I was... Uh, never trained to operate the new uh, multi-channel chemistry analyzer, but um, um, when when things went wrong, I was I was not expected to fix it. I was expected to fix the issue if the QC was out, uh, if you know, make recommendations on what to do. But there's no way I could ever actually run that piece of equipment. But um, broadly, I knew what to do if there was a, if there was a problem with the, the, actual, the actual testing. Now, I, I don't know if that's, a, if that's a good example, if that's what you're talking about, but uh, as the lab manager, you have most likely the technical experts in, in the laboratory, your, your job is to know something about that, but it, you've got technical experts. Your job as the manager is to make sure the, the people are functioning, not necessarily the equipment. And I would go back to what you had mentioned in the earlier response, which is what's the job description of this particular lab manager? Is it to motivate the team and help them get the tools that they need to run a successful laboratory as a team? Or is it this lab manager expected to be a bench tech alongside uh, the team members, in which case then they should have more of a specific knowledge of technical issues. But um, it goes back to what's the particular situation, what's that job description? All right, so, um, so two more answers to what, what's a good leader. One says, um, uh, Maria Adams says a good leader should pay attention to the ones they are leading and recognize each person's weakness. Sorry about the, the buzzing. <laughs> and recognize each person's weakness and strengths. They should also be able to work on the bench and not just dictate what to do. Uh, last one, the qualities of a leader, approachable, firm, a good listener and open to suggestions. Okay, and now for the last question we have here. How would one deal with team members that seem to know it all and have answers to every suggestion, but decide not to act to improve systems? All because they are against the leader and always try to talk the rest of the team from obeying this leader. Yeah, it's a good question. I'm dealing with this right now. So I, I think guys. we have another sabotage question. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Mary Jo, you started well, talking. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the question again. Um, well, this says team members, <laughs> not just one. I was yeah. going to say if it's, if it's a team member who is the know-it-all um, and is, is going to sabotage the team, you call that person. And maybe, you know, if 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 this is only, only part, part members of your team, then the whole team is being dragged down because of this. So maybe this is maybe this is a time for the leader in one of the team meetings to 
not have a team meeting devoted on working on the project they're working on, but just to lay it all out there and say, okay, um, you know, we're not functioning as a team. Not everybody is, is on the same page. And why is that? And what can we do to get on the same page and start functioning as a team? Because we certainly aren't now. Um, my, 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 uh, one of my bosses and I used to do this. If we, if we had a person who was not um, kind of acting just like this, but it was one single person, we had this thing called, it's not about you. You're not, you're not the, not everything is about you and what, what you want to do and what you think should be done. It's about the team. And so uh, get over this. It's all about me and start acting like a team member. Very good. Yes, I, I would agree. You got to, again, open that line of communication and uh, discover whether there's an underlying insecurity issue there or not being not feeling like they're part of the team. So they're kind of sabotaging the team to get noticed. Um, there's all sorts of reasons there. Some people are just, you know, um, well, like that one said, uh, they think they know it all and uh, they're not going to listen to any directions that don't fall in line with what the way they're thinking. So if you can't redirect them, then you need to uh, remove them as, as a team member. Is this also a question where they, the, and, and is it just certain members of the team or the majority of the team don't have trust in their leader and feel like their leader isn't able to lead? Yeah. Oh, good yeah, question. we would have to have um, would have to have the anonymous att attendee uh, uh, comment on that. Who wrote the question? Yes. Yeah. Well, um, but that's our last question so far. So that's that's great. I really yeah. really appreciate the feedback on the leadership qualities. I uh, hope. You have enjoyed this as much as, as we have. Our, um, our our contact information is up there on the screen. Feel free to reach out to either of us uh, by email, and we'd be glad to uh, follow up on any other questions that you may have. But uh, again, uh, thank you for all that you do. It's not always easy to be out there and working with lots of different people and projects and and feeling like uh, you know you, you can't get past the day to day, but but uh, you're you're doing the good work. It's it's showing, and you just keep trying to be better as far as a leader goes. Couldn't have said it better, Paul. Yes, this has been this has been great. Really appreciate the opportunity to. Uh, to speak with you today and, and work with you. And, and like Paul said, if you've got any other questions, uh, feel free to email. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mary Jo and Paul. Um, Ken, I think you're, or, or Dan, if you're on, uh, I have to, I'll hand it over to you now. Uh, no updates here. Um, we'll just uh, look forward to seeing everyone next Tuesday for the next session of the course. And that's me again. <laughs> All right. Very good. Take care, everybody. Thank you, All everyone. Right. Bye, Bye, everyone. Bye.